Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our biology playlist. In the last videos, we talked about the biology of the kidney or excretory system, as well as your skin biology. This is called nephrology. This is dermatology. Today, we will review both of them very quickly. If you have not watched my previous videos, this will be extremely fast for you. I've told you. So please watch the videos in my biology playlist in order. Also, as a side note, I have another playlist called Biochemistry for students preparing for MCAT, DAT, and other exams. Homeostasis, what does that mean? It means let's keep the internal body environment stable. Please do not confuse homeostasis with hemostasis. They are not the same. Urinary system, let's go. You have two kidneys, and this is called the renal pelvis. Then we have ureters, and then we have the urinary bladder with the famous detrusor muscle. And then this is the urethra, which has two sphincters, internal sphincter and external sphincter. As you know, the internal is involuntary, which means autonomic nervous system. But the external is voluntary, which means somatic nervous system. This is the anatomy of the kidney. We're collecting urine, collecting urine. The nephrons are here in the pyramids, especially the loop of Henle, as well as the collecting ducts and tubules. And then let's collect that urine into minor calices, and then major calices, and then the renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra, and then to the outside of the body. The outer crust of your kidney is known as the cortex. The inner core is known as the medulla. Where does sweat come from? From your blood. How about urine? From the blood. How about saliva? From the blood. How about your precious crocodile tears? From the blood. All body secretions come from the blood, including urine, of course. Therefore, we have to have blood vessels here. This is your afferent arterial, and this is your efferent arterial. Let's filter that blood through the glomerular capillary in the Bowman's capsule, and then we have filtered fluid called filtrate which will be inside the kidney tubules. And these tubules can be called nephron. Parts of the nephron include the Bowman's capsule, followed by proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting tubules, collecting ducts, and then minor calesis, major calesis, renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra. And this is the story one more time. We start with the arterioles, we filter the plasma, and you end up in the urine, if you are one of the bad stuff. How about the good stuff? We can reabsorb you back to the blood. Speaking of blood, where did this afferent arterial come from? It came originally from the aorta, particularly the abdominal aorta. Abdominal aorta will give you the renal artery in the abdomen area. Renal artery will then branch into segmental arteries, interlobar artery, arcuit artery, interlobular artery, afferent arterial, glomerular capillary tuft, and then efferent arterial. Where is filtration? It is here, from the glomerular capillary tuft and into the nephrons. The kidney is an example of a portal system. Why? Because we have two sets of capillaries connected in series with la porte between them. La porta. Here's the first set of capillary, known as the glomerular capillary tuft. Here's the second set of capillary, and this is the peritubular capillaries, What's connecting the two together? What's, where is the porta? La porta here is the efferent arterial. As you know, there are other examples of portal circulations in your body. Here is a great slide to review. The red color is arteries, the blue is veins, and the yellow is what's going to end up in the urine. Let's do it quickly. Arteries, we start in the left ventricle of the heart, aorta. The abdominal aorta is going to give you renal artery, which will branch to segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, interlobular artery, afferent arterial, glomerular capillary tuft, efferent arterial, peritubular capillaries, also known as vasa recta, if your loop of Henle is long, then let's go to the venous side because this is capillary between an artery and a vein. But the previous capillary was between two arterioles. That's the difference. This is a set of capillary between two arterioles. This is another set of capillaries between an arterial and a venule. Let's go venule, interlobular venule, arcuate venule, interlobar vein, segmental vein, renal vein, inferior vena cava, right atrium, 
right ventricle. What's the name of the valve between right atrium and right ventricle? Tricuspid valve. Right ventricle, give me to the pulmonary artery. What's the name of the valve here? Pulmonic valve. Pulmonary artery, lungs. And then the lungs will take the carbon dioxide out, give you oxygen, then pulmonary veins, then left atrium, then to the left ventricle via mitral valve, and you do it again. Speaking of the filtrate, it got filtered here between the glomerular capillary tuft and the Bowman's capsule. And now we start the nephron story. Bowman's capsule, then proximal convoluted tibial, then the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tibial, collecting ducts, minor calesis, major calesis, renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra. Pause and review. Notice the difference between the glomerular capillary tuft and the peritubular capillaries. What's the origin of the glomerular capillary tuft? The afferent arterial. But what's the origin of the peritubular capillaries? The efferent arterial. The first set of capillaries is between two arterioles. The second set of capillaries is between an arterial and a venule. Double portal. All of the previous was the structure or the anatomy of the kidney. Now, let's turn our attention to the function or the physiology. These are the functions of the kidney. Please pause and review. Now, let's talk about the endocrine function, aka kidney hormones. The kidney secretes lots of hormones. These are the most famous three. Erythropoietin, vitamin D, especially the active form of vitamin D, also known as 1 and 25, dihydroxycholecalciferol, aka calcitriol, and there is renin, which is a protein that comes from the renal, the kidney. Oh, renin. What's the main function of EPO? To stimulate your bone marrow to make lots of red blood cells. What's the function of vitamin D? To keep your bones healthy and to regulate the homeostasis of calcium and phosphate. What's the function of renin? To raise your blood pressure and to prevent it from falling. If EPO's job is to stimulate the bone marrow to make red blood cells, what do you think the stimulus for EPO release will be? Anemia. Because if I have anemia, I will respond by increasing my EPO release from my kidney, thank you kidney, which will increase red blood cell, which will try to correct the anemia. Wonderful. This is the vitamin D activation pathway, which we have talked about before. Remember that for vitamin D to work, you need sunlight, ultraviolet rays, you need skin, you need liver, and you need your kidneys. Pause and review. If you have any problems here, please refer to my video called Vitamin D. A kidney without blood pressure is nothing. Put differently, no BP equals no PP. If there is no blood pressure, i.e. if I have hypotension, I will not be able to make any urine called oliguria, less urine, or anuria, no urine. This is kidney failure right here. That's not good. In other words, the kidney without blood pressure is screwed. Therefore, the kidney has a vested interest of regulating your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is low, the kidney will respond. And if the blood pressure is high, the kidney will also respond. Otherwise, the kidney is toast. If you drop your blood pressure, the kidney will respond by increasing salt and water retention, which will increase the volume in your blood vessel, which is the force. And when you increase the force, you will try to increase the blood pressure and back to normal. The exact opposite will happen if you have hypertension. This is dangerous to your kidney right here. Why? Because I lost blood. When I lose blood, I lose blood volume. No kidding. I get extra cellular fluid volume depletion. My blood pressure will decrease. That's dangerous for the kidney. It can lead to kidney failure. Therefore, the kidney will respond by secreting renin, which converts angiotensin O gen to angiotensin 1. Thanks to the angiotensin converting enzyme from your lungs, Angiotensin 1 will be converted into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has two functions. Function number 1 is to tense the angio, i.e. constrict the vessels to raise the blood pressure. Function number 2 is to secrete aldosterone from the zona glomerulosa of your adrenal cortex. Aldosterone has four functions in life. Reabsorb salt, reabsorb water. This will raise your blood pressure back to normal. It also decreases potassium and decreases hydrogen. That's why too much aldosterone can cause hypokalemia and alkalosis. The difference between aldosterone and ADH was discussed before. In a nutshell, 
aldosterone wants to reabsorb salt and water. This is obligated water. Conversely, antidiuretic hormone wants to reabsorb free water, water without any electrolytes. Where does aldosterone come from? From the adrenal cortex. Where does antidiuretic hormone come from? It was made by the hypothalamus secreted by the posterior pituitary. Back to the nephron. Here is the afferent arterial. We're trying to filter blood here. Okay, in order for me to go this way, I need filtration pressure. Okay, medicosis, my plasma has been filtered. I did not filter my red blood cell. I did not filter my plasma proteins. Excellent. What's going to happen to that filtrate? Most of that filtrate is good stuff that should return back to the systemic circulation in a process known as reabsorption. How about the waste products? Let's dump them into the urine from the peritubular capillaries to the nephron in a process known as secretion. And therefore, the urinary excretion rate, if I'm waiting here with a camera, special camera, in your urine, what's gonna be dumped on me is what was filtered minus what got reabsorbed plus what got secreted. This is the histology of the kidney. A ferrant arterial is here, glomerular capillary tuft, and then the efferent arterial. Who should get filtered? Only the plasma, only the water in the plasma. No plasma proteins are allowed. Access is denied for two reasons and no red blood cells are allowed because they are too big. The filtration barrier or filtration membrane is made of three layers. First layer, endothelium. Second layer, glomerular basement membrane. Third layer, podocyte foot processes. What determines filtration, what determines reabsorption, and what determines secretion is the status of your stalling forces, hydrostatic pressures which push oncotic pressures, which pull. Normally speaking, we are pro-filtration. What does that mean? We're going this way. We're going from the afferent arterial and into the Bowman's capsule. In order for us to go this way, the favoring forces should exceed the opposing forces. Usually they exceed by a matter of 10 millimeters of mercury. What are the favoring forces? The hydrostatic pressure pushing in the capillary, all right, I'm gonna push, that's a favoring force, it favors filtration, amazing. Another favoring force is the Bowman's oncotic pressure, which is zero, so let's ignore it. The opposing forces are forces that are against filtration, and they include the Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure, this right here, which is trying to push the opposite way, and the glomerular pulling force known as the capillary oncotic pressure, which is caused by albumin. The mechanisms of tubular transport are either transcellular or paracellular. Paracellular is always passive. Transcellular could be active or passive. When it's active, it could be primary active transport, usually at the basolateral border, or secondary active transport, usually at the apical or luminal border. This is the normal physiology of the proximal convoluted tubule. It basically reabsorbs all of the good stuff and it dumps some waste. It also regulates acid-base balance in your body. Pause and review. Loop of Henle, counter current mechanism. Don't forget this lovely doozy. One sodium, one potassium, two chloride, symporta or co-transporter. And since we are reabsorbing salt, salt is gonna attract water in the other side. This water is leaving thanks to the absorption of sodium. It's being pulled by the sodium. The descending loop of Henle is the concentrating segment, while the ascending is the diluting segment. For reasons that were discussed before, please pause and review. If you have any problems, refer to previous videos in this biology playlist. What's the most important part in the loop of Henle? The thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. We're also reabsorbing lots of stuff. And I mean lots of stuff. After the loop of Henle, you have the distal and the collecting ducts, which contain two different types of cells. Principal cells, because your hormones principally work here, also because these are the most abundant cells, and the alpha intercalated cells for acid-base balance. Here is the principal cell. Here is the alpha intercalated cell. Don't forget that aldosterone wants to reabsorb salt and water. It also wants to dump potassium and hydrogen. 
but ADH wants to absorb only pure water. This is ADH or vasopressin, which acts on V2 receptor, opening aquaporin 2 channel to reabsorb H2O. And this is facultative, this is free water. Free to live, free to choose. Take a deep breath, because we're done with the kidney. Let's talk about your skin, the largest organ in your body. These are the functions of your skin. Covering, protection, thermoregulation, osmoregulation, water balance, immune function. It has antigen-presenting cells known as Langerhans cells. Your skin is made of epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Epidermis comes from the surface ectoderm, which is ectodermal. Dermis and hypodermis come from mesoderm. The special cells known as melanocytes, which make melanin, come from the neural crest cells, which is also ectodermal. These are the structures of your skin. Epidermis is here, dermis is here, hypodermis is here. Ectoderm, neural crest, mesoderm, mesoderm. Please pause and review. You need to know everything on this slide. Thermoregulation. If it's hot, you will vasodilate and sweat more. If it's cold, you vasoconstrict and you sweat less. Either way, you need sympathetic fibers. When it's hot, you need sympathetic because it tells the sweat glands to secrete sweat. If you are cold, you need sympathetic for the erector pili muscles, which is more prominent in cats as compared to humans. Babies have brown fat, which keeps them warm. Since brown fat is less efficient, i.e. is going to release more heat. If you want to learn more about kidney physiology, I have a course on renal physiology on my website, medicosisperfectionedit.com, which you can download once and keep for you forever. I also have another premium course on the acid-based disturbances that happen in your body, the best in the world. Most doctors are lacking in this area, with the exceptions of very few nephrologists. Or my brand new surgery high yields course, as well as my emergency medicine high yields course. All of them are at medicosisperfectionedis.com. You can get a 50% discount on any course by using discount code ARDS. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.